If you would like to go ahead and open your Bibles, we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1 this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Karen Johnson attended services so regularly as a child that she received a perfect attendance award. As she matured into adulthood, Karen began teaching Sunday school classes. But now the 67-year-old counterattendant at a slot machine parlor no longer attends church. She says, I have my own little thing with the Lord. Which includes listening to religious and political podcasts. Karen falls into the category now that has been called spiritual, but not religious. The term first appeared somewhere around 1960. Before that time, it was generally understood by people that the words spiritual and religious had essentially the same meaning. But now they are distinguished to refer to those who no longer associate themselves with so-called organized religion. What does it mean to be spiritual? That's the concern that Paul has as he speaks to the Corinthians in the entire letter that we call 1 Corinthians, but in particular in the first four chapters, as Paul identifies problems that exist in the Corinthian congregation, and he deals with those problems by correcting the ideas of the Corinthians and also calling out their mistaken notions. And this morning, as we look at 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 9, we find especially Paul speaking to the idea of identity. What does it mean to be spiritual? And in speaking to this idea, Paul asks and answers, in so many words, three questions. The first question appears in chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Are you merely human? Paul says to the Corinthians, But I could not address you, brothers, as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not? Merely behaving as humans? But when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? Paul says, are you merely human? He addresses the Corinthians using several different terms. And the first term that he uses for them is brothers. He says, and I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people. Now, this is not accidental. The Greek word brothers often included females, and I think that's the case here. Paul's not setting apart the men of the congregation in this situation. So really he's saying, to you, Christian family, we are family. You have some problems. You have some wrong ideas, and those wrong ideas have led to some wrong behaviors, but you are still my brothers and sisters in Christ. And he's following the very advice that he has already given to the church in Thessalonica, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, he says, If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. But, listen to this, do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. And that's what Paul's doing. The church in Corinth has some problems. But as he begins this section where he chastises them, and he's going to say some hard things to them. He doesn't open with criticism, but with a reminder that we are part of the same family. The family of God in Christ. But not only does he call them brothers, 
He says, you are behaving as people of the flesh. That's the way that it's translated in the ESV. And in this translation, there are actually two different Greek words that stand behind the phrase of the flesh in verses 1 through 4. The one Greek word that Paul uses means fleshy. It just means human. But the second one means fleshly. Fleshy and fleshly. And that one is not just human, but human in the sense that you are prone to temptation and sin. And so he says, you're people of the flesh. You are weak. Now this is the sort of smack in the face to the Corinthians because they've come to believe that they are above the flesh. That they are spiritual. But he says, I can't address you as spiritual people. But as people of the flesh. As fleshy and fleshly people. Who are prone to sin. Then he addresses them <laughs> as infants in Christ. Now there's some question as those who study these things comment on this passage about what exactly Paul is saying when he says, I fed you with milk and not solid food. But there is a clear teaching in the New Testament that although the truth of the gospel does not change, we grow in our understanding of it. Last week we read from Hebrews 5 and 6 where the Hebrews writer says, I would like to move on from the milk, from the basic teachings, but because you haven't grown, we can't do that. And Paul here says to these Christians in Corinth, you should be to the point, in so many words, you should be to the point that you're beyond the milk, but you're still infants. You haven't grown. And what is that growth supposed to look like? Well, Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, the last verse of that letter, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is, grow in your behavior in your reflection of the Spirit of God, to grow in the grace of Jesus Christ. But also, you've got to grow in the knowledge, too. You've got to move from the milk of the Word to the meat of the Word. And Paul says to these Corinthians, I would like to address you as spiritual people, but it turns out you haven't grown. Now, that's a somewhat grotesque image to think about Christians who are adult babies. But that's what Paul says these Corinthians are at the time. But then he uses one more term, and this one may have been the biggest slap in the face to the Corinthians. He says, not only, not only are you fleshy, fleshly, and infantile, you're just human. You're merely human. And once again, the Corinthians believe they're more spiritual than anybody. And he says, no, you're not spiritual. You're just human. And we can take this two different directions as we think about ourselves. I want you to imagine that the person who taught you the gospel had the opportunity, and maybe that person does, to examine you and to see how much you have grown since you first became a Christian. What terms would that person be able to use to describe you and your walk with God right now? Would they be calling you an infant of the flesh, merely a human, or would they be able to address you as spiritual? Now, I think that you can find among those who call themselves Christian at least two misunderstandings and misapplications of what it means to be spiritual. There are some Christians who think they are super spiritual. And they hold their heads up high and they stick their chests out like the Corinthians and they pray like the Pharisee in Jesus' parable, I thank God that I'm not like other men, sinful as they are. And they hold their noses up at people who are merely human. But the reality is we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 6. And no matter how much we grow and no matter how much we mature, we're going to sin and fall short of the glory of God. 
And so we can grow and we can be spiritual, but we're certainly not going to brag about it. That shows that indeed we are not. But then there's another extreme, and I think that sometimes we might be tempted more to fall into this one. We're readily available to admit that we are not super spiritual, but sometimes we allow that to become a justification and an excuse and say, well, I'm only human after all. And what do we really mean by that? I'm only human after all. We mean, well, I've got some failings and I'm never going to overcome them. And that's not God's desire for his people. It's not his desire that we would remain as infants feeding on the milk of the word and living in an infantile way in his grace and his truth. It is God's desire that Christians grow in grace and truth so that we can correctly be identified as spiritual. So the question that Paul asks and that we need to consider this morning, first of all, in verses 1 through 4 is, are you merely human? The second question that Paul asks implicitly and answers comes in verses 5 through the first part of verse 9. He says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor, for we are God's fellow workers. Paul uses again several different terms, now not to refer to the Corinthian Christians, but to himself and to Apollos, preachers of the gospel. And remember, as you turn back in chapters 1 and 2, what you find is that Apollos and Paul are not leading this, but there's a division in Corinth. There are people in Corinth who are lining up under the name of Paul, and people in Corinth who are lining up under the name of Apollos, and Paul says, let me set the record straight. Let me show you what it means to be a preacher of the gospel. And the first term that he uses is the word servant. He says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants. Now, there are several different Greek terms that could be translated as servant, but the word that Paul uses here is the word diakonos. It's the word that sometimes is translated as deacon, as in the qualification list that we find in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and Titus chapter 1. But it is usually just a general word for someone who performs acts of service. And that would include the person who in the ancient world served food who waited on the table. A waiter, a butler. Paul says, we're just servants. I want you to think about the nicest restaurant you've ever been to. And imagine that today, when we leave here, you go to that restaurant. Well, if it's a very nice restaurant, you're probably going to be greeted by a host or hostess, a maitre d', perhaps. And that person will show you to your table And there will be a waiter who comes and takes your order and brings your food. There may even be several different ones who serve at the table in a really nice restaurant, filling different roles. And you eat a fabulous meal. I hope you're not too hungry already. That meal is the best food you've ever placed in your mouth. And after the meal is over and the waiter comes back, the servant comes back to the table, what are the words that you might speak? You won't say, would you please tell the hostess that was a fantastic meal. You won't say, my compliments to the waiter on the best food I've ever eaten. No, what is the phrase that we use? My compliments to the chef. And Paul here says, we're simply those who wait on the table. We're not the ones who designed or planned or prepared. We are simply the ones who served. And he uses a metaphor 
He uses the metaphor of a field. He says, I planted, Apollos watered. I'm a plowboy, he's the water boy. And we are working in God's field. Now this agricultural metaphor that Paul uses is very appropriate in the ancient world. People were much closer in general to the process of agriculture than you and I probably are today. But there was also an understanding in the ancient world among the people that any time something grew, it grew because God, if you're a Hebrew, a Jew, the one true God, or if you're from a pagan religion, the gods made it grow. Now today, we assign its growth to our own gods. We call them natural processes and science. And if you think we don't view them as gods, take a closer look at the way that people talk about them often. But it was appropriate for Paul to use this metaphor because the people already had an idea in their mind that growth came from God. And so Paul says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered the seed, but God, you already know this, God is the one who made it grow. And so the emphasis is not upon the plow boy or the water boy. The emphasis is upon God. But then he uses another term to refer to himself and Apollos, and this one is so important because he says, he who plants and he who waters are one. This refers to unity. Perhaps unity of value, that Paul and Apollos are equally valuable as preachers of the word of God, but probably more likely to unity of purpose that they each had the same end goal. And that was to serve so that God would be glorified. And this unity present among the preachers of God's word was severely lacking in the congregation at Corinth. They were divided. And Paul says, these very people among whom you are lining up among whom you are dividing yourselves, we're united. If you want to line up behind us, you need to get in line behind God. Because we're united behind Him. And then the last term that Paul uses to refer to himself and to Apollos is fellow workers. And I love verse 9. Most English translations don't show it to you because it's a little bit awkward if we put it this way in English. But if you were to look at it in the original language, Paul has God at the front of every phrase in Greek. So he says, God's fellow workers we are. God's field and building you are. God, God, God. God is in the front. And so he says, we are God's fellow workers. He doesn't mean that they are co-workers with God, but that they are co-workers for God. They are serving him. And so Paul has made a very clear emphasis upon God. What is a preacher? One who makes God take the limelight. Now we have a great history in the American Restoration Movement of understanding that preachers are not any more important than Christians. There's no quote-unquote clergy laity distinction. You look at the men like Alexander Campbell and Thomas Campbell and they made it clear that they didn't believe that a man had to be ordained to be a minister. That instead it was the responsibility of the church to preach. And so there was no quote-unquote clergy who were special and set apart by some man-made process, and then laity, people who were under the clergy and less important in some way because they didn't have the same training. But instead, they said, we're all Christians, and Christians ought to be people who preach the word. But this problem that we're talking about, this clergy-laity distinction, it didn't start with the denominationalism that Alexander Campbell and Thomas Campbell were seeking to, to rise above. The problem goes all the way back to the first century in places like Corinth where the people were lining up behind individuals instead of lining up behind God. And there are two solutions to this problem. The first solution is to emphasize the priority of God. 
Now we make a practice, whether we're sitting down for a meal, or we're preparing for a Bible class, or a worship service, of praying to God and acknowledging that everything we have, all of our blessings have come from God. But we need to take great care that that practice does not become mere lip service. That we truly see and understand that everything we have comes from God. And then and only then do we begin to emphasize Him as the priority. But then the second part of this solution is not only that we emphasize the priority of God, but we recognize the biblical identity of the preacher. And to use a modern metaphor, think about a movie. God is the one who wrote, directed, produced, and starred in the movie. The preacher is the delivery boy who hands you the DVD. God is the deliverer. The preacher is the delivery boy. And if we will begin to think about the preacher in this way, then we can look at the worship service and the sermons that are preached and not say, what a great preacher! But instead say, what a great God. What a great God. Paul says, what is a preacher? A servant, a delivery boy, a plow boy, a water boy, someone who's united in the service of God with his fellow preachers. But then finally, he asks and answers the question, what is the church? And he gives two metaphors. He says in the last part of verse 9, for, we are, for you are God's field, God's building. Now this first metaphor builds on the language that Paul has already used in referring to himself and Apollos as workers in the field. It reminds me of the parable that Adam read for us from Mark chapter 4, in which Jesus says a man goes out and he plants seed in his field and he goes to bed and overnight it grows and he doesn't know how that happens. Now Jesus' point is actually more about the harvest, as is made clear in parallel records of this parable in the other Gospels. But the idea, I think, informs Paul here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I want you to think about what it means for Paul to use the metaphor of a field to refer to God's church. And while we could talk about many different applications of that, I want to give you three here. And the first one is that if God's church is represented as a field, then we recognize that it belongs to him. It is for his glory. If you think about today, a farmer who owns land and he has all of these fields and he plants crops and he gets a great yield from those crops. And it's so great, it is so noticeable that there's media out and they're talking to him about what he's done. And, you know, he's going to get the credit even if he has farm hands who actually did all of the work. And likewise, if the church is God's field, whatever work we may do in that field, it's not for our glory, but it's for God's glory. But then I also think about this. If the church is God's field, some translations say his tillage, his garden, his cultivation, there's going to be some variety within it. I am not a gardener, but some of you are. But what little bit I've seen of agriculture and gardens, no two plants are alike. They're very similar in some cases, but no two plants yield exactly the same amount of fruit. No two plants look exactly the same. And so if the church is God's field, and, and then we, by extension, the individuals in the church are God's plants, we are not expected to be identical. But we may be expected to be united. But I also think about this in that regard. Any field that has good things growing in it has foreign elements attacking it. Whether it's insects, 
whether it's animals that are trying to feed upon it, whether it's blight or some other fungus that's trying to damage it, or it's the natural elements that work against it. And if God's church is a field, and we are the plants within it, we should not be surprised that at times we've got to spray some insecticide. But then last but not least, the church is God's field, and there's a variety within it and elements attacking it. It is up to God what is to be done within it. He gets to decide which plants are uprooted. He gets to decide which plants are beyond saving. He gets to decide which plants need to be pruned. That decision does not rest with man, but with God. Then Paul uses another image. He says not only that the church is God's field, but also the church is God's building. And he's going to talk more about that in the verses that follow. God's building. This image helps us to see that the church is the result of careful planning on God's part. There's a blueprint. God had a plan for the church. It's a plan that began before the ages. And in that plan, God has constructed his church upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. And we are the individual stones as members of the body of Christ, that make up that building. And there is care on God's part to maintain the building and see that it remains in good repair. And thus the verse that we quoted at the beginning of the service. So with yourselves, strive to excel in building up the church. 1 Corinthians 14, 12. What does Paul communicate with these two metaphors? Well, first I think about the ways in which many so-called Christians today are practicing Christianity, and I wonder if those practices really reflect the images that Paul has given us in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9. Because if the church is God's field and God's building, then it does not belong to men. It's designed is not up to men. Its care and organization is not up to men. It doesn't belong to a pope or a president or a convention or a synod. It belongs to God. And any departure from God's blueprint, from God's design, is taking away God's glory and putting it on some man's imagination. But then I want you to think about this. To get a little bit closer to home, a little bit more personal. If the church is God's field, then you are a plant. If the church is God's field, then you are a building block. If you belong to his church. And what are your responsibilities? And when we combine these two images, I think that you have three. The first one is to grow. If you are part of God's church, your responsibility is to grow. Now you might say it's a little bit odd to think about a building block growing, but that's exactly what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, that we are living stones. We're not just stagnant, we are living stones. We are part of God's field and God's building, and therefore we are to grow. But then there's another aspect of this, because as God's field and God's building as individual plants and building blocks, we also have this responsibility to support one another. Think about the crops in a field. They grow in close proximity. In many cases, their root systems become intertwined. And they are organized in such a way so that when the wind blows, most are protected. So that when there is an overabundance of water, through their combined root systems, they are able to stay upright and soak up that water. They bear one another's burdens, to use biblical language. Or think about the building blocks in a structure. 
Those blocks are laid one upon another so that together all of the blocks shoulder the weight. So not only do we have responsibility as individuals, part of God's field, God's building to grow, but we also have responsibilities as God's people to support one another. And then last but not least, when we grow and when we support one another, we exist, don't miss it, for God's glory. Remember the way that Paul worded it. The English says you are God's field, God's building, but in Greek it says God's field, God's building, you are. He gets the glory. As Paul speaks to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, he asks and answers three questions, all really revolving around the idea of being spiritual. And in doing so, he explains, even for us, Christian identity. What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be part of God's church? We don't have to look for identity. God has revealed it to us. If you're part of God's church, if you are a plant in the field or a block in the building, your responsibility is to grow and support your fellow Christians so that God may be glorified. And maybe this morning you realize that you've either fallen short in the area of growth or you need the support of your fellow Christians, or perhaps it's both. We're going to sing an invitation song. Make it known to your fellow Christians that you're ready for their support and you're ready for continued growth. Maybe you're not yet a child of God and you want that new identity. You want to become a child of God. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you're ready to turn away from sin. Confess Jesus as Lord. We will immerse you this morning in water. And God will make you new. He will wash away your sins by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you will become part of his field, his building, for his glory. If you're looking for identity this morning, won't you come now as we stand and as we sing together?